Let me add my good morning to everyone here today. We have a fine assembly. We're so grateful for your presence today. I consider it an honor to stand before this fine audience to be able to bring God's word this morning. As we do so, I invite you to open in your Bibles to first, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. In this chapter, Paul is writing to Timothy, telling him to not be ashamed. In verse 8, Paul says that Timothy must not be ashamed. In verse 12, Paul says that he himself is not ashamed. And in verse 16, Paul says Onesephorus was not ashamed. Let's read the inspired text beginning in verse 8 together. Be not ashamed, therefore, of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but suffer hardship with the gospel according to the power of God who saved us and called us with a heavenly calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before times eternal, but now hath been manifested by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ to abolish death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher, for which cause I suffer also these things. Yet I am not ashamed, for I know him whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. The good thing that was committed unto thee guard through the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us. Paul is saying in this section, Timothy, don't be ashamed. First, don't be ashamed of the testimony, the message. Don't be ashamed of that, Timothy. Secondly, don't be ashamed of me as the Lord's prisoner. But instead of being ashamed, suffer hardship with the gospel. Why? Because God saved us, and he did so through that message, through the gospel. Not only that, but God also called us with a holy calling. That calling was in harmony with God's purpose and grace. It was God's eternal plan to save mankind. That plan was known, made known by Jesus, the one who abolished death and revealed life and immortality again through the gospel message, the message that needs to be preached. And to that end, Paul says, I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher. My job in these roles, and yours too, Timothy, as a proclaimer of the word, is to preach the gospel. However, he says in verse 12, because of what I do in that role, I suffer, yet I'm not ashamed. Why, Paul? The reason that Paul gives is going to be the topic of our lesson. In looking at the reason, we want to notice that Paul is talking about wisely investing his treasure. Not physical treasure, spiritual treasure. If we think about it, we're all investing in something. We may be investing in our careers. It may be a family. It may be sports. It may be a hobby. It may be a combination of things. But we're all investing in something. And so we want to look at the idea of wisely investing our treasure. And in doing so, our focus is going to be on the greatest treasure that we have, which is a spiritual treasure. And so let's look at the reason that Paul was enduring suffering without shame and notice some important biblical truths with regard to investing. In this context, the focus is on investing our spiritual treasures. And so let's look at what is involved in wisely investing. Certainly these elements can be seen in our financial investments, but they're of primary importance when we consider the spiritual as we consider our eternal future. 
The first element we want to notice is that wise investing involves a deposit. With regard to our money, we understand that we can't enjoy possible gains if we don't make a deposit, if we don't invest anything. There may be a great business opportunity with a fabulous return on investment. It may have a guaranteed return. It may have low initial costs. It may be a great investment, but it does us no good if we don't put money into that venture. We must make a deposit. Billionaire businessman and the founder of the Templeton Mutual Funds, John Templeton notes that one of the fi primary financial principles is that the only way to avoid mistakes is not to invest, which is the biggest mistake of all. If we don't invest anything, we're not going to get a return. Notice from our text in verse 12 that Paul references that which I have committed unto him. The word Paul uses literally means a deposit. It is something that is committed to another's charge or their trust. Now there is some ambiguity of the language in the original, which just says my deposit. When Paul says my deposit, it may be his in two different senses. It may be his in regard to what someone has put into his care. And so he's responsible for that deposit. Or Paul might be saying that it was his because it was something belonging to him that he put in the trust of another. And so there are two primary views. It's similar to the biblical phrase, the love of God. Does it refer in the subjective to his love for us, where God is the active subject, as in 1 John 4, 9? Or does it refer in the objective for our love for God, where God is receiving our love, as in 1 John 5, verse 3? It's very difficult to tell until we look at the context. One view in the text is the language is subjective, and that is the idea of the deposit is the same one that is used elsewhere. For example, in 1 Timothy 6.20, and also in this same chapter, verse 14, Paul speaks of that which was committed to Timothy, which refers to the gospel, that which was entrusted to him, the sound doctrine. This particular word is only found three times and only in Paul's letter to Timothy, and so some take the view we need to maintain consistency in the use of this term. The ESV, ESV translators took this view, and they translated this as, what has been entrusted to me? This would coincide with the idea found in 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, where Paul says, but even as we have been approved of God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. And so that's one possibility. The other view is that this is objective. And the idea of a deposit is that which is what Paul committed into God's safekeeping. And other than the ESV, most standard translations reflect this meaning. That this is something that is a deposit that Paul has given to God. This would be in harmony with other passages such as 1 Peter 4.19 which says, wherefore, let them also that suffer according to the will of God commit their souls in well-doing unto a faithful creator. It would be similar also to the words of Jesus on the cross in Luke 23, 46, when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. This view has man entrusting something to God in verse 12 and then God entrusting something to man in verse 14. And that's the view I hold. I'll give you a couple reasons for that. One is from the context with regard to who is doing the guarding. In the first case, God is said to be the one doing the guarding. But in the second case, Timothy is given the charge to guard. God is the one who guards our souls, but preachers must guard the purity of the gospel. In addition, there is the term my or of me in verse 12, and that in ordinary language 
would be an obvious use of something that belongs to the person. It would be a personal possession, not something that was placed into his trust to share. In addition, there's an important time element specified. The deposit was to be guarded until that day. And so there's a future view. The word of God endures forever regardless of what man does. And there's no direct relationship with the end of time. But the condition of the soul of Paul would be of the utmost importance with a view toward the second coming. Furthermore, notice the previous phrase, him whom I have believed, or some translations say, in whom I have trusted, points to Paul placing something of his own into God's care, and that's connected to the second part with the conjunction and, which speaks about Paul's deposit. And so it would make sense again for Paul's putting something into God's hands. He is making a deposit. Well, how do you make a deposit with Christ? It begins with gospel obedience. That's the process by which you initially turn your life over to God and you entrust him with your spiritual welfare. And then it continues with a life that is dedicated to him. On a continual basis, you live for him and entrust your life and your spiritual keeping in God's hand. And so in a spiritual sense, if we're going to be wise investors, we need to make a deposit with God. We need to turn our souls over unto his divine keeping. The second element is that wise investing involves confidence. And we understand that with physical investing, trust is a great key to how and where we invest our money. We want to go to a financial institution that has a solid reputation. They have a strong backing. We want to have the assurance that our money will be in good hands and that they'll keep our investments safe. Would you be confident lending your money to a man on the corner with a police ankle bracelet holding a cardboard sign that says, Bob's Easy Money? Would that give you confidence? This is where I want to put my money. No, you want something that gives you confidence, something that's sure. We must have confidence in the keeper of the funds. If we don't, then we probably just hide our money in a mattress. But maybe that isn't such a good idea either. A number of years ago, the Associated Press reported about an Israeli woman in her 40s who would not share her last name who was living in Tel Aviv. And she said that she bought her elderly mother a new mattress as a surprise to replace the old one she had been using for decades. And on the following day, she learned that her mother had hidden her life savings in that mattress. And she had thrown it away along with the $1 million inside. A local newspaper printed photos of the woman searching through the garbage at the dump. And the dump manager reported she appeared totally desperate. Yes, I can imagine. Most of us are probably very careful with regard to how we invest our money. But notice what Paul says in our text as we go back to the spiritual. In verse 12, he says, I know him whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to guard that which I have committed to him. Paul speaks of two aspects in this verse. First of all, there is a personal knowledge that provides confidence. Paul is not investing with a stranger about which whom he has no knowledge. It's not someone he just met. This is the Lord. It's someone in whom he was able to place his greatest trust. Paul knew the divine nature of the Lord. Notice Paul's knowledge is not in a what, but in a who. Paul was not interested in the man-made schemes around him. He was not interested in the latest spiritual success from the elite of his day. His confidence rested squarely in the Lord. 
he could be sure the Lord would keep what he committed to him. And notice also there is absolutely complete confidence. Paul says he's also persuaded with regard to the Lord's ability. Paul was convinced the Lord is absolutely trustworthy. And this confidence is seen in the various translations. The NIV says, I know whom I have believed and I am convinced. The ESV says, I know the one in whom I trust and I am sure that he is able. Weymouth says, I know in whom my trust reposes and I am confident. Paul is absolutely sure about the safeguarding of his deposit. The Lord is able to guard or watch over what he's entrusted. Where do we place our confidence? Do we place it in men? Do we place it in our own ability? Many around us are doing that. They turn to those who are esteemed by the world. They put stock in the opinions of the so-called experts. But friends, that won't work in the spiritual realm. There is only one worthy of our soul's security, and that's the Lord. No one else is qualified. Jude says, Now unto him that is able to guard you from stumbling and set you before the presence of his glory without blemish and exceeding joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power before all time and now and forevermore. Amen. That's the one in whom we need to put our trust. Many people in the religious world are putting their confidence in the shifting sands of human thinking. But the only solid option we have for a happy future is to trust the Lord with our souls. That's where we should place our confidence. The third element we want to notice is that wise investing involves a long-term view. We don't invest in financial vehicles for the present. We do so with a view of time toward the future. We put our money into something that is going to yield a future benefit to us. In order to reach a goal, we must accept, therefore, short-term sacrifices. If we have something in mind for the future, we don't just spend our money on every want that we have. We don't recklessly squander every paycheck because we have a view to the future. We look toward those coming gains and we look to the future value. And so we may be tempted by impulse items, things that we want right now, but when we have a fixed view to the future, that will help us make sound decisions and we will be disciplined. It will also help us keep in mind what's most important. Stephen Covey, the author of The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, said it's easy to say no when there's a deeper yes burning inside. How much will that dollar I save today be worth in 20 years? It's going to be worth more than a dollar, isn't it? And so we need to take a long-term view. Paul had a long-term view of his spiritual investment. Notice the last part of verse 12. Paul speaks of what he had committed unto him against that day. That day is a future time. It's a time of the second coming and the great judgment of all mankind. It's the point at which time ends and eternity begins. It's also the beginning of the heavenly reward if we have invested wisely. Notice in verse 18, Paul says in reference to Onesephorus, the Lord grant unto him to find mercy of the Lord in that day. We find the expression again in chapter 4 of this book. Familiar passage beginning in verse 7, Paul says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me at that day, and not only to me also, but unto all them that have loved 
his appearing. That's the day in view. And so in order to invest wisely in our souls, we must keep our eyes looking ahead. We must be able to look along, uh, uh, away from this life and keep our eyes focused on eternity. And so a long-term spiritual view will help us to make solid decisions. For example, when we're tempted with the pleasures of sin, we can remember Hebrews 11.25 that the pleasures of sin only last for a season, only for a short time. And are we willing to trade our long-term security for a moment of pleasure now? If we can keep that in mind, it will help us to avoid dangerous mistakes. Remember Covey's words, it's easy to say no when you have a deeper yes burning inside. We need to cultivate a deep burning within us of a spiritual future. Do we truly agree with Paul as he says in Philippians 1 verse 23, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, for it is very far better? Or are we more like Demas, about whom Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4.10 that he loved this present world? You see, the difference is, where do I have my focus? Is it on the here and now, or is it on a long-term view for my spiritual success? Jesus says in Luke 21, 34, But take heed to yourselves, lest happily your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly as a snare. When our hearts are attached to the things of this life, then we're not ready to make decisions in the best interest of our spiritual future. According to 1 Timothy 4.8, the prophet for which Christians should strive is the one that has the promise of life that now is and that which is to come. There is a future element that we need to keep in mind if we're going to invest wisely. Then the fourth element that we want to notice from the text is wise investing involves a sound plan. How do we invest our material treasures? In a physical realm, we follow a financial plan. Perhaps we outline how much we will invest, where we're going to invest, how long we're going to keep it there, and other elements of a plan. There are many options available. It seems like everyone has a different approach and they're always coming up with new investment strategies. And so we have multiple choices. And yet regardless of which option we select, the experts say find one and stick with it. So many people suffer financial difficulties because when it comes to their money, they just wing it. That probably isn't the best way to invest your hard-earned money, just winging it. But how do we invest our spiritual treasure? Do we just wing it and hope it'll work? We need to follow a plan. Notice what Paul tells Timothy in verses 13 and 14. Hold the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, guard through the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us. If we're wise spiritual investors, it behooves us to hold that pattern of sound words, to guard that which was committed. In this case, Paul moves from the who of our trust to the what of our trust. But in this case, it's not simply selecting from a number of options. Sadly, with many in religion, they just follow with what they think is right or what their parents did or some other, some other superficial decision. They follow what some man preaches, perhaps. But unlike our financial plans with regard to our soul's future, there is only one successful plan. As one writer put it, we can't go with our gut to guarantee that we get to glory. In other words, we can't just wing it. 
We have to go to the scriptures and see what is God's plan for the security of my soul. That guide is the Bible, and there's no substitute for that. There's only one truth that God has revealed, and that is the plan that brings spiritual success. However, there may be specific tools that you can use to help you. How do we follow that biblical pattern? Well, maybe there's some tools you can use. Maybe you have a Bible reading schedule. Maybe you need a study plan. Maybe you need to write church every Sunday on your calendar so you don't fill it up with other appointments and you keep your appointment with God. All those things will help you follow God's plan. And there's many of them available. Take advantage of those to keep you disciplined in following the plan. Also, don't be too proud to ask for help. And we understand this in the physical realm. There are many people with the experience and the knowledge who can assist you with your financial planning. Certainly there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe you don't understand how to calculate future value or amortization or portfolio diversification, but there are some who do. Why not take advantage of that? But what about our spiritual lives? Are there brethren who have studied for years and years and have the knowledge and the experience that we can gain from? Are there sisters whose lives show they understand how to have a good marriage? Are there preachers who understand the arguments against false doctrine when we get stumped? There's help available from one another. And that should be an opportunity for us to share the resources that are available. Notice again Paul's words to Timothy in verse 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee Guard through the Holy Spirit which dwelleth in us. This is the same word for deposit, but this time modified by the term good. Timothy is encouraged to guard the treasure, guard the good deposit. In this case, the deposit is equated with the pattern of sound words from the previous verse. It's the good doctrine referred to in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. And if we do that, then we'll follow the plan that will lead us to an ultimate return of our investment, success in reaching a heavenly home. And that should be our financial aim, spiritually speaking, reaching what God has promised for us. Consider with me the parable that Jesus tells as recorded in Luke chapter 12. It's probably familiar to us, but let's be reminded of the great lesson it holds. Luke 12, beginning of verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentiful. And he reasoned within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have not where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there I will bestow all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast many goods laid up. For many years, take thine ease, eat, drink, be merry. But God said unto him, Thou foolish one, this night is thy soul required of thee, and the things which thou hast prepared, whose shall they be? Here's someone that God calls a foolish investor. You're a foolish one making these worldly plans. And what's the point of the parable? What's the spiritual lesson? Verse 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is an unwise investor with a focus on the wrong place. Earthly wealth shouldn't be our primary focus. Financial success isn't the main thing in life, contrary to what others may be telling you. That's not what life's about. We must strive to be diligent to invest in our future and be rich toward God. Sadly, many people are experts with regard to monetary investments and they're haphazard spiritually. Let's all be wise investors. Yes, we should be wise investors with our money. We should be good stewards. 
In the parable in Matthew 25, verse 27, the master tells the servant, Thou oughtest, therefore, to have put my money in the bankers, and at my coming I should have received back mine own with interest. Yes, we should do that, but that's not what's most important. Whether you die as a king or a pauper, that's not the important thing. What is important is, are you going to die in a right relationship with God? That's what's important. In order to make that true, to be in a right relationship then requires that you be in a right relationship now. That means you must commit your soul to God by obeying the gospel. Allow your faith to prompt you to turn away from sin, to confess Jesus as the Son of God, and be immersed to have God wash away all your sins. When you do that, God will forgive you. But it also means that you continue to commit your soul to him through godly living, through a life of dedicated service to him. It means you commit your soul unto him until that day. Invest in your spiritual future and begin today. Maybe there's a change that you need to make in your life to be on the spiritual right track to success. And this morning, if we can help you, we'd be delighted to do that. If you would just make that known as together we stand and sing, will you come?